Raul returned home after a tough shift at work and immediately heard his son's crying and his wife Paloma's shouts. He sighed deeply, thinking, same story every day. I can't take this anymore. How long until I find a good nanny for Maro? Entering the house, his son rushed to the door to greet him. The child hugged him tightly, tears streaming down his face. E, Daddy, you're finally home. I was waiting for you. Mom scolded me. She yelled so loud. She's mean and doesn't like me. Raul gently stroked the child's head and whispered, Calm down, son. Don't cry. Let's see what happened this time. If your mom scolded you, there must be a reason. Paloma, irritated, soon emerged from the room to intervene. And why shouldn't I scold him? He behaved terribly today. The nanny we had recently quit and asked for her salary. She couldn't handle it. She lasted only a month. Said dealing with such an active child was exhausting. She continued, Look, today he broke that expensive Chinese vase we had. And he keeps throwing things around the house. Let's see if you can explain to him that this behavior isn't normal. The child quickly tried to justify. It was just an accident, daddy. I swear. The nanny refused to play with me. Instead, she tried to make me learn poetry and write letters. I asked her to let me rest a bit and suggested we play hide and seek. She just decided to hide behind the door, thinking she wouldn't be found there. What nonsense. Of course, I saw her immediately. When she came out from behind the door, she tripped over the table leg and the vase fell. It's not my fault she's so clumsy, daddy. Raul couldn't help but imagine the hefty nanny hiding behind the door and burst into laughter. Paloma looked at him, puzzled. Why are you laughing? Instead of scolding our son, you start laughing like a child. You always do this. Listen, Raul, you're not helping at all with Moro's upbringing. You have no control over him. Raul shrugged calmly. Dear, stop yelling. I'm very tired today. I did three complicated surgeries at the hospital, and now I have a terrible headache. You'll see for yourself that the problem isn't that big. The nanny left. So what? We'll find another one. Let's organize something like a home audition. Let the child choose which candidate he prefers. Then he won't keep complaining every now and then. It'll be his choice, not ours. Paloma was surprised by her husband's words. Are you serious? What can a five-year-old decide on his own? Well, let's sit down to dinner. Tonight, I'll repost an ad online and contact a hiring agency to get us in touch with other available nannies. After dinner, Raul played with his son and had a great time. They assembled a puzzle and played pretend taxi company. He felt so relaxed spending time with the child, like reliving his own childhood. Maro always behaved well with him, giving hugs and showing affection like a little kitten. Raul couldn't understand why Paloma couldn't do the same and become friends with their son and the nannies, none of whom stayed with them. After all, Maro was just a normal child, cheerful, impulsive, and clever like all kids his age. Late at night, after putting his son to bed, Raul tried to. Embracing Paloma gently, pressing his body against hers, Raul yearned for some love and affection from the woman he loved so dearly. However, she turned to the wall, irritated, and said, No, Raul, don't touch me. I'm exhausted after spending the whole day with Maro. Why did I agree to adopt him? Thank goodness we don't have our own children, or I would have gone insane by now. Raul interrupted abruptly. Never say that again. I love Maro as if he were my own son. Or even more. It's like he's my own son. I've always dreamed of having children because I know it brings immense happiness. But you can't understand that. Good night. Raul was so agitated that he couldn't sleep anymore. He lay in bed, reminiscing about his past. Dreaming of becoming a doctor since childhood, Raul came from a family of medical professionals. He often accompanied his parents on hospital shifts, witnessing firsthand how they saved lives and aided in recovery. This instilled in him the desire to do the same when he grew up. He had no trouble getting into medical school and excelled as a student. There, he met Laura, a calm, modest, and beautiful girl from a poor family. She studied nursing at a vocational center and worked as a lab assistant at the university to support her family. Raul fell in love with her from the moment he saw her. Their relationship blossomed, despite disapproval from Raul's parents due to Laura's humble background. Just a few months before their wedding, 
Raoul was suddenly sent to intern in another city with a prominent cardiac center. The farewell was difficult, but Laura assured him she would wait and urged him to focus on his work. However, a month later, she stopped answering his calls. Worried, Raoul asked his parents to find out what happened to Laura, but they couldn't locate her. When he returned home, his parents delivered the devastating news. Laura had died in an accident during a trip to a nearby city. Raoul fell into depression, feeling like his life had come to a halt. He contemplated visiting her grave to bid farewell, but his parents advised against it, insisting it would serve no purpose. They encouraged him to focus on his studies and work, reminding him that Laura wouldn't want him to ruin his life over her death. Reluctantly, Raoul heeded their advice and threw himself into his career. Over the years, he became a highly skilled and professional surgeon, striving to overcome his loss. Despite the pain, Raoul found solace and purpose in his work, ultimately honoring Laura's memory by dedicating himself to saving lives. Raoul struggled to schedule appointments months in advance, yet his personal life wasn't thriving. With his parents gone and nearing 40, he remained unmarried. Though he had short-lived flings, none compared to Laura, who still held his heart after all these years. Five years later, at a presentation of innovative equipment, Raoul met a young, ambitious journalist named Paloma. She approached him, asking questions and even requesting an interview. Thus, they met. One day, Paloma showed up at his door unexpectedly, seeking help understanding medical text paragraphs. Enchanted, Raoul found it hard to look away from her seductive neckline and slender legs showcased by her short dress. They dined together, drank wine, and somehow woke up in the same bed the next morning. Embarrassed, Raoul blamed himself, thinking he'd had too much wine and forgotten his manners. Expecting Paloma to be furious, he was surprised when she laughed it off, proposing marriage instead. Overwhelmed with passion, Raoul thought, why not? Paloma was young, intelligent, and attractive, perfect wife material for a renowned surgeon. They moved in together, enjoying passionate nights like any other couple. However, one thing bothered Raoul. Paloma didn't want children. She was preoccupied with work and her figure, constantly scrutinizing herself in the mirror. Life seemed perfect until a tragedy struck at the hospital where Raoul worked. A young mother died during childbirth, leaving the baby orphaned. Moved by the story, Raoul visited the baby in the neonatal unit, feeling drawn to him. Despite Paloma's reservations, Raoul decided to adopt the baby, whom they named Maro. To their surprise, Paloma welcomed the idea, suggesting they hire a nanny to manage their busy schedules. Thus, Maro became Raoul's son, bearing his surname, fulfilling his long-held dream of fatherhood. As a child, Maro didn't even know he was adopted. He adored his father, but his relationship with Paloma was strained. Growing up, he felt her indifference. She never wanted to spend time with him, only paying attention when his father was home. The rest of the time, Maro was in the care of a nanny. When he was young, they had a good nanny, a kind lady who knew how to handle children. However, when Maro started walking, the nanny complained about not being able to chase after him and had to quit. Since then, they went through several nannies, none of whom stayed long. Some were too young, glued to their phones and neglectful, while others were older and bulky, unable to keep up with Maro. The latest one quit that very morning. Raul couldn't quit his job, as he was the main breadwinner, and Paloma had no intention of leaving hers to care for Maro. She never developed a maternal instinct for the child. At most, she could offer a hug or a kiss on his cheek for Raul's sake. What Raul truly desired was for Maro to be less mischievous, to sit quietly in a corner and draw or play, leaving him in peace. He even bought Maro a good tablet with lots of games, hoping he would finally stop running around the house. However, Raul was against video games, believing they made children foolish and lazy. He wouldn't allow his son to become like that. Unlike his wife, he was glad Maro was growing up as a real child, a bit naughty, restless, and curious, just like he was as a child. On Saturday, three candidates came to their house for the nanny position simultaneously. Raul was sitting at his desk, reading their resumes, with Maro playing trains beside him. Paloma sat on a large, soft sofa, ready to witness the fascinating spectacle of a five-year-old choosing his nanny. 
She couldn't help but think it was a foolish idea but was curious about how it would end. The first candidate was a stern-looking woman in her 50s with glasses. She had an impeccable professional career, speaking three languages fluently and working as a teacher. Raul greeted her and said, According to your professional background, you have a lot of experience, but I'm afraid our son is peculiar. I'd like you to talk to him, and if he likes you, we'll hire you. The woman approached Maro, but as soon as she started talking to him, he ran to his father and hid behind him. It was clear that this nanny wouldn't work out. The second candidate also bid farewell, leaving only the last of the three. She was a friendly young woman in her 20s. When she entered the office, Raul sighed, immediately thinking that this girl wouldn't know how to handle his son either. However, to his surprise, she quickly found common ground with Mara. Her voice was cheerful and calm, and they soon began playing trains together. The nanny played the role of the station master, and Mara, of course, was the train conductor. The boy smiled at his father, very happy, and said, Daddy, I found my nanny. Let Erica stay with us. I promise to obey her as we agreed. Okay? Raul felt more at ease and called Erica to sit at the table and sign the contract. It was only then that he noticed the pendant she wore around her neck. His face went pale, and he leaned back in his chair, even taking off his glasses to rub his eyes. Erica was startled and asked, Are you okay, sir? Don't worry. I know I'm young, but I love children. I'll do a good job. Morrow is a sweetheart, and I'm sure we'll get along fine. His wife also became concerned seeing her husband's strange reaction on the sofa, but concluded that he was just tired. Raul had a mishap at home, yet thought it through. He wasn't feeling well, blaming it on a dreadful headache. Must have been a magnetic storm, he muttered. Nonetheless, he welcomed Erica, a young nanny, to care for Maro. After Erica's arrival, Paloma bombarded Raul with questions, suspecting something amiss. She confronted him about his choice of the inexperienced nanny over a seasoned professional. Paloma's jealousy flared accusing Raul of being attracted to Erica. Raul reassured Paloma, holding her close. He dismissed any special interest in Erica, attributing his headache to sudden discomfort. He emphasized his devotion to Paloma, assuring her of his fidelity. Though Paloma remained skeptical, she agreed to monitor Erica closely. She vowed to remove Erica swiftly, unwilling to tolerate a potential threat to their household. Raul sought solace in a trip to the park with Maro, observing his son's carefree play. Amidst the distractions, Raul couldn't shake one question. Where did Erica get her pendant? It resembled a custom-made piece he'd given Laura, his deceased girlfriend. As months passed with Erica in their home, Raul noticed a positive change in Moro's behavior. Erica's gentle approach fostered a strong bond with Maro, easing tension in the household. However, Paloma's jealousy lingered, evident in her critical remarks about Erica. Paloma's relationship with the young lady who served as their nanny was strained, to say the least. The lady always acted as any polite and discreet person would in the household. She ignored Paloma's petty comments and tried to smooth over any unpleasant situations, which only further infuriated Paloma. Paloma was at her wit's end, not knowing how to rid herself of the nanny. Then, an insidious plan arose in her mind. Throughout this time, Raul attempted to ask Erica a few questions. However, whenever he began a conversation with her, his wife would suddenly appear out of nowhere, eyeing them suspiciously. Erica mentioned to him that her mother had passed away many years ago, which only confirmed Raul's suspicions. However, he refrained from asking her directly about the pendant, sensing it would be impolite. The more closely he examined the new nanny, the more she resembled Laura, long neck blue eyes, and golden curls. Even her cheerful and melodious laughter reminded him of his first love, which was the strongest of his life. The lady even seemed a bit embarrassed when she noticed his prolonged and contemplative gaze. In the end, Raul couldn't resist and decided to verify whether he and Erica were related, or not because this idea wouldn't leave him in peace. One day, he discovered a hairpin that the young lady had left on the table in the children's room with some strands of hair in it. Carefully, he collected them, put them in a bag, and decided to conduct a DNA test right away. His wife entered the room and saw but didn't cause a scene. She just looked suspiciously, picked up the hairpin, 
and said aloud, The nanny left this hairpin on the table. I guess I'll have to return it to her tomorrow. It's a curious object, simple yet stylish. The woman replied irritably, There's nothing special about it. It's a cheap and insignificant thing, just like this girl you practically hosted in our house. Oh, a nanny who's only thinking about how to make you fall in love with her, or thinks I'm blind. Raul managed to restrain himself from responding to his wife with harsh words. Instead, he hugged her and said, Don't talk nonsense, darling. Erica has become very close to our son. No other nanny we've had before has managed that. Not even you. What's bothering you now? Let's not argue. Let's make some coffee. What do you think? And then I'll give you a relaxing massage. The woman pretended not to be angry with her husband, but began to hate the nanny even more. Thousands of thoughts raced through her head. What is Raul planning? Perhaps if she's trying to seduce him, it's for some reason. And if this boy they adopted isn't completely strange to him, why is this girl so sweet with Maro? And he follows her everywhere and acts with her like an obedient child, not as he did before. There must be some reason. I have to get rid of her as soon as possible. Any means necessary. Paloma decided and executed her cunning plan. It was a weekday like any other. Erica and Morrow had spent a good time at the playground due to the pleasant weather. Then, they learned a poem, and after lunch, they played with modeling clay. They were having fun as usual, but the child's parents had already returned home, and it was time for the nanny to leave. Paloma went to the room to change clothes, and suddenly she was startled and began shouting throughout the house, Raul, come here right now. My jewelry is missing from my jewelry box. There were three pairs of gold and diamond earrings, not to mention the rest of the jewelry. Raul rushed into the room and tried to calm his beloved wife. Don't shout so loud. How could they have disappeared? We don't have thieves in our house, as far as I know. Maybe you misplaced them and have forgotten. Why worry prematurely? Erica also stepped into the hallway and asked nervously, Sorry to interrupt, Raul, but it's time for me to go home. Has something happened? Paloma started shouting even louder. Look, she's here. The thief. I'm sure this modest girl stole my jewels. Let's open her purse and check the pockets quickly. We'll find out everything right now. Erica looked very. Paloma was taken aback by these accusations, feeling utterly humiliated. She had never stolen anything from anyone. So why were they treating her like a thief? Without a word, she emptied her bag, spilling its contents onto the hallway carpet. Everyone gasped as Paloma's missing jewelry box tumbled out of the nanny's bag. Erica, the nanny, began to cry and attempted to defend herself. I didn't take anything, I swear. I don't know how your jewelry ended up in my bag. It's all a misunderstanding, she pleaded. But Paloma couldn't contain herself. She was yelling uncontrollably. See, Raul, this shameless woman, you hired her as a nanny, and now see what kind of person you let into our home. She stole my jewels and acts as if she's not at fault. Leave now, you're fired. And if you don't, I'll call the police and you'll go to jail. Then you'll have time to reflect on what you've done. The nanny covered her face with her hands and fled the mansion. Running home without looking back, tears of resentment and injustice streaming down her face. Raul was shocked by what had just transpired in his home. He couldn't believe Erica was truly a thief. He had thought she didn't seem like that kind of person, but seeing the jewelry box fall from her bag and her rush to leave upon hearing Paloma's screams made everything clear. Initially, Raul contemplated reaching out to Erica, intending to calmly discuss everything, but he reconsidered. His wife was pacing back and forth, unable to calm down, continuing to besmirch Erica's reputation. Raul sat on the sofa, bewildered. Then little Maro tugged at his sleeve, saying, Daddy, I need to tell you a secret. It's urgent. But Raul wasn't ready to listen. Wait, son, it's not the right time. Go to your room, draw, play with something. You've seen what we discovered about your nanny. A week passed, and they still hadn't found a new nanny for Maro. Raul had to take a few days off to care for his son, who was sad, not eating well, and lacked the desire to play. He would sit at the table or by the window, seemingly waiting for someone. Only Paloma was happy. Finally, that insufferable girl was out of the house, no longer a rival. 
Raul still couldn't calm down. He received the results of the DNA test, and it was a huge surprise. There was no relation between Erica and him. Although he had been convinced that Erica was his daughter until then, he couldn't stop thinking about it. It was all so strange. Why did Erica have that necklace, and why did she resemble Laura, his first and only love? He had experienced the joy of finding his own daughter, and now what a disappointment. The day came to an end, and Paloma arrived home, intoxicated. At her publishing company, they were celebrating a successful deal with the businessman. Her report was excellent, and she was handsomely paid. She looked sadly at Raul, who had worn a somber expression for two weeks, then took a bath and retired to the bedroom. Raul noticed when the light came on in Moro's room and wondered if the boy had woken up. He went there, observed his room in silence, and saw Moro sitting at the table, drawing something with great effort. He approached and asked what he was drawing and why he wasn't sleeping. What Moro drew was a girl with long braids, arrows flying towards her. The sky was filled with dark clouds and lightning. Raul was startled and decided to ask his son some questions, trying not to alarm him. Are you sad because she didn't steal anything from anyone, and that's why you're crying? And is it because you miss her a lot? I want another nanny. Let Erica come back to us, please, daddy. The boy pleaded, tears welling up in his eyes. It had been something that had been troubling him for the past few days. He couldn't accept so much injustice, and now he was speaking the truth. Raul was surprised. Paloma was truly capable of setting such a trap for someone. He decided to speak with her immediately and clarify everything. Morrow hugged him tightly and said, I promise I'll fix this. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you that day. Go to bed. Everything will be okay. Trust me. The boy felt a little calmer and went to bed. Raul read him a story and his son fell asleep. Only then did he enter his wife's room, closed the door securely and began an unpleasant conversation. I know everything. It was you who placed the jewelry box in Erica's bag, accusing a good person of theft and humiliating her. Apologize immediately. Explain your action, Raul accused her. Cruel Paloma didn't even think of admitting her guilt. On the contrary, she began to shout. The boy told you yes, I did it, and I don't regret it. What did you expect? You bring this girl home, show her so much attention, and what not. I should just accept it. Furthermore, if I knew how tired I am of this life first, you decided to adopt a child and presented it to me as a done deal, then you hired Erica. You asked for my opinion. You asked if I agreed. Tell me why I should want someone else's child. I know Morrow is little, an orphan, or at least that's what you told me, but he's not my son. I never wanted children. I always said that, but you, you asked me to raise someone else's. I don't want that girl back in my house. Do you understand, Raul? He didn't expect such revelations from her, and was abrupt in responding to his wife. Then why are we living together? Maybe we should get divorced. No, I can't imagine my life without Mauro. He's become my son from the very beginning. And Erica is a good girl. You had no right to do what you did to her. You shame me. What you did is shameful, and it's a pity to admit that I was wrong again. You and I are different. Paloma almost jumped in surprise and told her husband, all right, I'll leave myself, and it'll be tomorrow. Raise your adopted son alone. You can bring the nanny back to this house if you think she's so wonderful. I'm a young and attractive woman. Prestigious men haven't stopped looking at me all this time. I don't need a family life like ours. I don't want to learn poetry or cook. I'm tired. I deserve much more. I thought we would live to enjoy life together, that we would travel to tourist places, go to concerts, and what did I have to do? Raise someone else's child. Goodbye, Raul. We won't live together anymore. The next morning, Paloma left, slamming the door. Raul was worried about Moro's reaction to the divorce, as he considered Paloma his mother. He tried to calm him down as best he could, explaining that his mother was going to another country on a business trip and would be away for a long time. The couple divorced without problems since they had no common children and didn't have to divide their assets. Everything they had was acquired before the marriage. Raul promised that he would find Erica to apologize to her and at the same time ask about the necklace. But it wasn't so easy. The hiring agency said that Erica had resigned after the scandal. It was Paloma who had reported it to the agency, claiming that Erica had stolen jewelry. With such a reputation, 
the young lady could no longer continue working as a nanny. Raul was shocked and began to explain everything to the agency manager. Please forgive us. It was my wife who placed the jewelry box in the nanny's bag to blame her for theft, but she was very jealous of me. I swear the girl didn't steal anything from us. I'm very ashamed of this matter. Please, ma'am, give me Erica's address. I need to try to fix everything, apologize. It was very ugly. My son misses the nanny and asks me to bring her back to the family. I understand that you're not obligated to give me her address, but put yourself in my place. The girl is not to blame for anything. Can you imagine? We are all one family. Erica immediately took him back to her apartment. She couldn't let this opportunity slip by, as she had already tried everything. When Raul entered immediately, he sensed the smell of medicines and drugs in the room. Muffled groans came from the bed. Behind the girl on the bed lay a thin, exhausted woman. Her long hair was tangled on the pillow. She clutched the sheet tightly and groaned softly, trying to bear excruciating pain. Raul was paralyzed. He looked at her face and realized it was Laura, his Laura, his first true love. He felt a pang in his heart. It was impossible to look at the poor woman's suffering without starting to suffer with her. Erica spoke very kindly and calmly. Aunt, try to be patient. I can only give you the injection in an hour. Look, I brought a doctor. He's a surgeon, and he's Moro's father. I've told you about him. Let him examine you. Maybe he can help. I'll step out so you won't be embarrassed. But if you need help, I'm here in the next room. Raul rushed to the bed, took the woman's thin, cold hand, and whispered, Laura, my love, I found you. My God, we found each other. But they told me you were dead. I spent years crying for you. Do you remember me? It's me, Raul, your old boyfriend. We were going to get married, remember? The woman looked at him in astonishment and even managed to smile for a moment. She whispered, Of course, I remember you, Raul. Is it possible to forget that love? If I knew how much it hurts to see you now, it would have been better if I had really died. Then I wouldn't have to endure the pain I'm feeling now. It's good at least to see us now while I'm still alive because I don't have much time left. The only thing that saddens me is Erica. She's so young, and I'll leave her all alone. Raul, I want you to know that in all my life, I loved no one but you. Oh, how all of this hurts, said the woman with a weak voice. She writhed in pain again. Raul remembered that he was a surgeon and began to examine her, feeling her back like any other professional would. Then he wrote down the names of the medicines on a piece of paper, gave Erica some money, and told her to go to the pharmacy. What kind of doctors have been here prescribing the medicines she's taking? This isn't treatment, it's just paralyzing the patient. Go quickly to the pharmacy and buy what I wrote. It will take effect. Meanwhile, I'll take a look at the test they did. He studied everything, frowning several times. Then he silently stroked Laura's hand and said firmly, Laura, it's too early to think about death, and I don't want to hear you talk about this again. We're certainly facing a difficult situation but we'll continue fighting for your health. I'll perform the necessary operation myself and do everything possible so that you never feel pain again. I never stopped loving you, my sunshine. Believe me, we still have a whole life ahead of us, so please trust me. Tears rolled down the woman's face. She looked at Raul, and her eyes seemed to reflect hope. Then she whispered with dry lips, I trust you, Raul. I trust you. The man immediately called the head of the department and arranged for emergency surgery. They had already lost too much time. He needed to act fast while Laura could still feel pain. The surgeon focused as much as possible, explaining to Erica in detail what she should do, and the girl ran through the apartment to gather all the medical reports, the accompanying papers, and other things from her aunt. She was praying, crying, worried about the outcome of the operation. Raul understood perfectly that the life and health of the woman he loved so much depended solely on him, and only he could make her walk again. When he left the hospital, he couldn't make a mistake. Laura couldn't believe that all this was happening to her. She had only loved Raul all her life, and after their separation, she could never love another person. She didn't expect to see him again, but now, when she was really ill, being beside him seemed like a kind of miracle. Laura was taken to the operating room. Lying on a stretcher, Raul squeezed her hand, 
and she lost the fear of dying. Now, she was smiling happily, trying to remember every trace of his face. The surgery lasted over five hours. Raul had to restructure the patient's spinal nerves millimeter by millimeter. He was sweating, but in the operating room, only his clear orders and the metallic sound of the instruments were heard. Finally, the operation ended when the surgeon had no more strength, but he was satisfied with the result. He had been able to do what he planned, and Laura's health prognosis was good. But the man didn't think about resting. He put on a fresh lab coat and remained by the patient's bed in the ICU. It was important to him that she heard him by her side when she woke up. One day later, she finally woke up completely. She turned her head and looked around the room. She saw Raul dozing by her side, leaning on a chair. The man didn't let go of her hand at any moment and continued to hold it firmly. She felt so loved and well that she thought, I hope this isn't a dream. It's possible that you heard me, my dear. You're here by my side, holding my hand. Isn't this happiness? When she moved her hand, Raul startled and looked at her alarmed. He began to stroke her hair, her hands, and whispered in her ear, Laura, my love, the surgery was a success. I managed to do everything very well. I'm sure everything will be fine now, and you'll recover. How are you feeling? Do you feel nauseous? I'll moisten your lips, and you'll feel better. He took care of her as if she were a child and shared with her everything that happened during the long years of separation. Laura, my love, why did you disappear? I called you every night several times, but you never answered the phone. I felt that something bad had happened, and then my parents gave me this terrible news. You can imagine how much I suffered. I thought I would go crazy, that I wouldn't be able to continue living. I cried for you, thinking you had died. Please tell me what really happened. Now that everything is in the past, there are no hard feelings. I just want to know the truth. It's very important to me, do you understand? She brushed her hair away from her face, swallowed the tears in her throat, and began to speak softly. My disappearance wasn't by choice, Raul. I loved you madly. Do you remember how we dreamed of getting married? We even thought of names for our children. We were so naive. But after you left, your parents came to see me and tried to intimidate me. They forced me to break up with you, saying it was the only possible solution for me. It was unthinkable. But then your father found out that my mother had a criminal record, suspended, and started threatening me to tell someone. If he did, she would lose her job and wouldn't be able to work anymore. I was very afraid of that. So, I had to do what they proposed simply because I couldn't let them harm my mother, do you understand? If you knew how hard it was to make that decision, knowing that I would never see you again, it was unbearably painful. At the time, I was pregnant with your child. But because of all these experiences, I had a miscarriage. All this destroyed me completely. I even thought about going to a convent to be a nun. I stayed there for a month, spending all my time praying. But I also had long conversations with the nuns, and they made me change my mind. They said I wasn't ready for it yet. I'll remember their words for the rest of my life. Live honestly with God. Don't hold a grudge against anyone, and don't forget to do good to people. Pray. And if God hears you, you'll see Raul again. So, I decided to volunteer and help homeless animals find new owners. And when my sister died, I took care of her daughter, Erica. She's a good girl, has a good heart, you know, understands. And then we started living together, she and I. Over the years, she became my daughter, and I never forgot about you, Raul. I tried to fall in love, but I couldn't. I couldn't love another man. And in the end, I spent all this time alone. I dedicated my life, taking care of my niece and stray animals. I found myself unable to walk anymore. I was terrified for Erica. I thought I would die soon. So I gave her necklace, which I had worn around my neck all my life. I was astonished to see you in my room. I could barely believe it. I thought it was a dream. Raul, my love for you is beyond measure. The man kissed each finger of her hand apologizing profusely, admitting his cowardice for not visiting her grave when his parents told him of her death. He confessed his fear and regret for not seeking the truth about her fate, acknowledging that he could have found her if he hadn't been a coward. My love, my angel, what you must have endured while we were apart, he lamented. During our separation, 
I continued studying, then working, eventually becoming a leading surgeon in my city. I wrote a thesis, got married, recently divorced, and adopted a child whom I now raise alone. I've suffered all my life, searching for a woman like you, but never finding a love like ours. I'll never let you go again, and I'll do everything in my power to make you healthy and happy once more. I believe our reunion happened for a reason. He shared everything about his marital disputes, the genetic test, and how the necklace story led him to her. Laura, astonished, exclaimed, it sounds incredible. Eventually, the woman began to recover, facing a long rehabilitation but eventually managing to rise from her bed, albeit still using crutches. Raul remained by her side, and Erica resumed her role as Moro's nanny. Raul and Laura moved into a mansion, raising Moro together. The boy soon grew fond of Laura, sensing her love and care. Erica also moved in with them, finding a good young man and reconnecting with her happiness. Now, Raul and Laura lived together as if those years of separation had never existed. Laura, beside the man she loved so much, began to feel better and younger. Her face glowed with radiance, her eyes reflecting her love. At 40, you can start a new life, Laura realized, enjoying nights filled with love and embrace. She decided to dedicate her free time to Mauro, playing with him and cherishing every moment. Her dream of becoming a mother had come true, and Morrow forgot about Paloma, feeling loved and cherished by Laura, Erica, and his father. No more yelling or scandals in the family, only laughter and fun. Laura proved to be an excellent cook, delighting the family with delicious meals. Raul hurried home from work, knowing he was loved and awaited. Laura continued her charity work, finding homes for dogs and cats, now with Morrow by her side teaching him to love and care for animals. After convincing his father, Morrow brought home a stray and sick cat. They nursed him back to health, and he became a beloved member of the family. A year later, Morrow started primary school, with Laura and Raul holding his hand as if they were starting their own journey anew. One evening, as the F family was having dinner, the doorbell rang, and Raul went to open the door. He was very surprised to see Paloma on the doorstep. She hadn't changed at all, impeccably dressed, wearing high heels, lips painted a bold color, and the same sharp look of a journalist. The man frowned and spoke first. Hello. I can't say I'm happy to see you because you're here, and don't say you missed me because I won't believe it. Paloma tried to smile and replied, Well, actually, I didn't think you'd treat me like this because it's true that I missed you, my love. I also wanted to borrow some money, 1000 or 2000 or maybe a bit more. You see, I couldn't stand out as a journalist in a big city because here, thanks to your friends, I had access to worthwhile jobs. But there, I can't do anything. I'm nobody. My boyfriend, a young guy, abandoned me as soon as my money ran out. So, can you help me or not? Raul was completely taken aback by such audacity and responded abruptly. For you, Paloma, I don't have any money. I won't give you anything. I've erased you from my life. Now I have a real family. I'm happy. I hope you also find a family. We've been separated for a long time, and now we're just strangers. You yourself said you were tired of me and didn't like children, right? So, I'm sorry, Paloma. I won't invite you in. I don't think it's necessary. Goodbye. The woman suddenly made a disgusted expression, pursing her lips, looked at him, and said, And what if I tell Morrow that he's adopted? Do you think he'll be very upset? or won't consider you his father? So, give me some money. Think about it, Raul. The man was furious and shouted, You want to blackmail me? Get out, because this is too much. The woman chuckled softly as she left. Very well, Raul, but be careful. You may regret your decision. When Mara went to bed, Raul told Laura everything, and they were worried about the child. Do you think Paloma won't tell Mara anything? I'm very afraid because he's still young and we don't know how he'll react to this news. I'm afraid of bringing it to him. Laura also thought about this. I think we can't hide it from our son, she said. Keeping it a secret isn't right. If Paloma doesn't tell, other people will, and the sooner Morrow finds out the truth, the better he'll be able to deal with it, and you won't have to fear any blackmailers. Suddenly, Erica suggested, I can try to explain everything to him while we're playing. I hope to succeed. 
I'm studying psychology, and I know that children don't perceive everything like adults. It's in a different way. Instead of telling everything at once, it's better to explain little by little, you know? Raul agreed with the young woman, although he was still very worried. There was no other way because Paloma had already realized that she could manipulate him in this way and would take advantage of the situation by demanding money constantly. Erica kept her promise. She had a long conversation with the child, and then they started drawing together. An hour later, the boy climbed onto his father's lap, hugged him, and said calmly, You're still my daddy. You're the person I love the most, and you love me too, right Raul? Raul couldn't hold back the tears. They welled up in his eyes, and he felt so happy, so relieved, and so good as he never felt before. He loved this little boy more than his own life. So, he hugged him and looking into his eyes, replied, To me, you're my son, Morinho. I love you very much, and I'll never disappoint you. I'll always be here, no matter what people say, understand? The boy nodded and snuggled closer to his father. It had been a while since they had become a family, not by blood, but by fate. However, Paloma didn't give up on her decision to get revenge on her ex-husband and waited for the whole family while Raul and Laura were strolling with Maro in the park after school. The boy was laughing a lot. Raul chased after him and caught him. But the boy? He darted away and sought refuge behind Laura. It was at that moment Paloma approached him and applauded. How lovely, isn't it? An exemplary family. A father, a mother, and a son, Maro. Hi, my boy, remember me? After all, a year ago you still called me mommy. Remember? She taunted. Hey, did you know that this man isn't actually your father? You were adopted. He's a stranger to you. They're not your real parents. They don't care about you, Paloma sneered. Raul clenched his fists in anger, wanting to shield his son. But Maro stepped forward and replied calmly. I know my biological mom died and my daddy adopted me. He's the person I love most in this world. He's the best and he loves me and Laura. And you, Paloma, you're mean. You never wanted me. Leave us alone. Raul smiled, lifted his son, and whispered in his ear. Well said, darling. You're absolutely right. We're a real, tight-knit family. Besides, we don't want people like her around us. Let's go home and have some food. Maro held his father's hand with one hand and Laura's with the other as they headed home, leaving Paloma in the park, feeling humiliated and angry. Her plan had failed, and she never received any money. What was left for her now? Who would want her? Raul had changed a lot. He seemed so calm, so self-assured. He clearly loved this woman. What had drawn him to her? How foolish I am. Look at me, losing a man like him and destroying my family. Paloma realized, her pettiness and hypocrisy no longer making sense to her. She had no choice but to continue being this unhappy, lonely woman. Her fleeting affairs brought her no joy. Her work was deteriorating, and it was her fault. Recently, Laura had started feeling unwell again. She was nervous, couldn't sleep well, and her menstrual cycle was completely out of control. Raul began to worry about her health and convinced her to see a doctor. Laura tried to reassure him, Stay calm, Raul. I'm fine. I think it's because I'm over 40 now. Maybe menopause is coming. We're not getting any younger, my love, so sometimes I feel dizzy. I think it'll pass gradually. Two more months passed, and Laura didn't feel any better. Finally, Raul took her to a gynecologist he knew. He explained the situation to the doctor and waited in the corridor. A few minutes later, Laura and the doctor emerged from the consultation, both with tears in their eyes. Raul was alarmed and began to question the gynecologist. Things are bad, aren't they? It's about menopause, right? My wife has something serious. Wait a minute, Raul, this is normal. We're not young anymore, we have gray hair and all, and you still want to change diapers now. Menopause is what your wife says, but it's severe. She's 13 weeks pregnant. That's what's happening. And you mentioned menopause? You wanted to leave her at home until the day of delivery considering her age? That's risky, the doctor warned. Raul sat in a chair, covering his head with his hands. He couldn't believe what he had just heard. Laura was pregnant. They were going to have a baby. The woman also cried and hugged Raul, whispering in his ear. I can't believe it. After the miscarriage I had in my youth, 
I never got pregnant again. I never imagined this could happen at this age. It's true happiness. Better late than never. That concludes our story for today. But before we bid farewell, share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss a new story.